So welcome everyone, um, celebrating 20 years on advising medicines prescribing, the AWTTC and AWMSG. Um, it, it, it's a fantastic turnout, it's a great venue, so welcome everyone and thank you for attending. Um, we've got really a fantastic programme today. Um, we, the Minister has kindly taken time out uh, to uh, come and talk to us briefly, uh, but we're very grateful for her and we've got um, Mind It from NICE, we've got Sam Roberts coming down, uh, so <laughs> Mind It from NICE, we've got um, June Rain from MHRA and Richard Torbett coming down from AVPI. <clears throat> so we're very grateful for people making the, uh, the journey down here. Um, I would recommend that those of you that can stay till the end should do so because uh, there is a surprise laid on. It doesn't involve me at all and so I would recommend you stay to the end. So, <clears throat> if I do that, perfect. So, declarations. My only declaration is that I'm conscious I look ridiculous with a moustache, but I have to do it for November, I'm afraid. Uh, but my family wants me to get rid of it at 1 o'clock on December the 1st. So, medicines, are they important? Well, there's, for lots of reasons. <clears throat> From a budget perspective, you know, Welsh Government allowance is 23.7 billion, 10.1 on health and social care, but 8.3 billion goes on uh, the NHS in Wales. To put this in context, um, in 2002, um, the, the NHS in Wales was 3.4 billion, and I've noticed that Scotland was 6.7, which is almost double what Wales gets for health. We spend over a billion on medicines in Wales, so 4.4% of the total expenditure in, the UK, in, in Wales of Welsh Government expenditure goes on medicines, and 12.5% of the total of NHS expenditure goes on medicines. So it is very important. And <coughs> in the last few years, the increase in expenditure has really been more on the high-cost secondary care, tertiary care type medicines. So what else has changed since 2002? So back then, almost to the day, Wales were playing New Zealand at rugby. Uh, Wales were cautiously optimistic. Apparently New Zealand were in decline. Um, but um, unfortunately, all black flair flattens Wales. They lost 1743. And in 2022, well, Wales were playing New Zealand. And everyone was cautiously optimistic that uh, <laughs> Wales might do well at the rugby this year. And as you all know, um, it's the same old story. All blacks highlight Welsh weaknesses. And they lost 23.55. And the, the media suggests that uh, the governance of rugby within Wales is perhaps not ideal, and that there are warring factions within the WRU. In contrast, if we look at the football, well, Wales failed to qualify for the World Cup in 2002. Uh, but I remember going to one of the games at the Principality. This is this actually taken from the Russia game. And the fans around me were mostly from Cardiff. And they weren't really interested in the, the football or fighting the Russians. They just wanted to fight Swansea. Um, <laughs> and it was really very difficult. And now we've got Wales in Qatar, and it's fantastic. But one of the backbones for that has been the Walgorch, the, the Welsh supporters, who they all sit together now, and they are seen as exemplars of, of supporters uh, in international football. And I was lucky enough to be there for the Ukraine game. The atmosphere was fantastic. And I would suggest to you that one hypothesis is that Wales is not a huge country, and if we're riven by factions, we may not succeed. But actually, when everyone comes together, we are powerful enough to make a difference. The last 20 years, we are seeing huge diff uh, changes in technology. So this is it's called Moore's Law. It's the number of transistors on microchips. And it's very clear that the number of transistors doubles every two years. And so you go from 1970, the number of microchips in a... In a, uh, in a uh, sorry, the number of transistors and microchips is a few thousand. A, a microchip now can have 50 billion transistors. Um, but this is very... Con there's there's a, a, a literature that shows this very similar um, phenomenon. And th we see that in health. So this is the uh, medical knowledge, the growth of medical knowledge, which really since the Second World War has taken off. 
such that the doubling time for medical knowledge has gone from approximately 50 years in 1950. It is now estimated to be 73 days. So it's not just data, but actually it's figuring out what is important data that needs to be addressed. And when we look at uh, from medicines and genetics and genomics, um, the Human Genome Project. So they spent 2.7 billion US, sorry, 27 billion US dollars for the first 10 years. But by now, you can get a whole genome sequence for about 600 pounds. And that's crucial going forward with new medicines coming forward. And I think it's interesting that Moore's Law, actually, um, if you invest enough, you can actually surpass Moore's Law. What effect does that have? Well, we're seeing life expectancy increasing globally. Um, and really, it's amazing to think that towards th it's only <coughs> since about 1900 that life expectancy has almost doubled. And it's projected now that many people born today will live to be 100. Um, and I think it's important to note that some people will live to 100 despite what they do during their lives. So this is Winnie Langley, who uh, started smoking age seven, and at a age 100 was still... Well, she gave up smoking because she couldn't see the match, matches anymore. Um, but I think it's important to note that N equal one trials don't tell you anything. You've got to have good trials. And secondly, we have to be conscious of the decarbonisation agenda, which Sophie Howe is going to talk about later. So I hope you can indulge me. <coughs> My background was in cystic fibrosis. And this is Francis Collins, and he was one of the um, two lead authors for, for discovering the cystic fibrosis gene, CFTR modulator, back in 2009. <coughs> and following that, he then headed up the Human Genome Project. Uh, he then headed up the National Institute of Health, probably the most important medical position in the US, and he now sits on <coughs> President Biden's cabinet as the special advisor on science. And he said that at every stage during his uh, career, cystic fibrosis has been an exemplar for how to, to advance medical care. So I'm going to talk about, <coughs> this, is, um, this is the Jones family um, from, it used to be under my care. So you've got, uh, on the left, you've got Amy, on the right, Lucy, in the middle, Stephen, at the back, Molly. And Amy, Lucy, and Stephen all had cystic fibrosis. Um, and they've allowed me to give this story. So cystic fibrosis, this is the, for those of you who don't know much about it, this is the classic picture. It's a multi-system disorder. They don't absorb food. They're miserable because they, they're hungry the whole time. And you can see the ribs showing there because they get chest infections. And... It's an autosomal recessive disorder, so both parents will carry a gene, and on average, one in four patient, uh, people will have the condition. What's become very clear is that autosomal recessive as a model is actually out of date because it's the genes themselves that matter, and Deverick Hughes is going to talk about this later, but actually the medicines are specific for the genes the patients carry. We make the diagnosis on the sweat test, <coughs> and this... This, this is generally the equipment we use for a sweat test, and you measure how much salt is in the sweat. And you can measure the chloride, and if the chloride is above 60, uh, re remember there's 60, you've got CF. If it's below 40, you haven't. But we just use it for diagnosis because the most important thing is that 95% of patients with cystic fibrosis will die of respiratory failure. And the way you work that out is you measure their FEV1. So you can see the FEV1 on the side and age. And as you get older, with cystic fibrosis, the FEV1 gets lower. And the FEV1 is how much you can blow out in one second. And FEV1 tells you how long you're going to live, really, because if your FEV1 is 50%, you're not going to live as long as someone who's 70%. So from a CF perspective, all the trials were predicated on changes in FEV1. And I remember going to meetings, they said, oh, we've got a 3% increase. And I said, oh, gosh, what does that mean? Well, they may live a month or two longer. Oh, great. So FEV1 is the major thing that matters. So coming back to the Joneses. So Amy is the eldest on the left, uh, and traditionally the first child is always the more severely affected because the second child, the diagnosis is made sooner, you can start treatment sooner. But actually Lucy was the sicker, and despite everything we did, she just got worse and worse. And we'd reached the stage where she'd come in for two weeks intravenous antibiotics. After two weeks we'd say, you're not quite right, we'll keep you for a third. And then she'd go home, and after a week, we'd say, oh, you're not doing so well. I think we'll get you back soon. And so her life, really, was three weeks of intravenous antibiotics in hospital, three weeks at home, and she died age 12. Um, and so Amy was better, but actually still 
pretty bad. And so we could see her deteriorating. And she was 15, and she was actually... She knew where she was going, the family knew where she was going, and we knew where she was going. It's very difficult. So, European meeting in Prague on cystic fibrosis. And I still <laughs> remember this very clearly. So, Friday evening, 6.30, there was late-breaking science, and there was very little in the abstracts. And apparently there were other things to do in Prague at half six on a Friday night. So it was just a bunch of anoraks there. They, I, I could, honestly, there was probably about 20 people in the room. And there was a presentation on VX770. Um, and they hadn't looked at FEV1. They looked at sweat test. And the sweat test, and you can see the blue line there, on this medicine, the sweat test was in the normal range. And I still get goosebumps thinking about this, because this was a seminal moment. You think, gosh, what is going on here? And so it became clear that it was a very limited number of people who would respond to this medicine. But by chance, Amy fitted that criteria. So two years later, the meeting in Dublin. So I went and found the medical director in a smoky bar one late night, and he agreed to um, give the medicine to Lucy, uh, to Amy. So this is Amy, age 24. She came to see me in clinic, and she had gone on to uh, either Kaftor for the first time. She was the first patient in Wales to go on a modulator, um, and she came to me and she said, "I've got a job, I've got a boyfriend, I've got a life." And from a cost perspective, that is really powerful. So. <coughs> These medicines are still not cheap, and I think it's very important that we're able to step back and say, what is the benefit? And we've now got the, the new medicines. Either Kaftor only worked for a very small proportion of the patients, but the new medicines that have come through are much more powerful. The issue was the cost. So up until 2013, total expenditure on CF care in the UK was £125 million. There was in Wales, there's about 3% of the patients, but the total cost in the UK was 75 million. So this is a 60% increase in cost of care just for 3% of the population. So the ethics and the morals and everything are very difficult. The new modulators work for 90% of the patients, and that's been <coughs> very good. It's been introduced in Wales. And there were a number of factors here that I think are, are exemplars. First of all, there was good data. There's registry data, there was genomics data, such that Andrew Evans and Mark Francis could go and negotiate in a position of strength, knowing exactly what was happening. And Andrew tells me that Wales has probably got the best deal in the, Wales, in, in the world now. But that is based on good data and good genetic data, and that's very important. Uh, this is W. Edwards Emory, uh, Denny, who is one of the fathers of quality improvement. And he said that without data, you're just a person with an opinion. And I think it is crucial going forward that we have data, both uh, prospective data, but real-world data. And finally, going back to the Red Wall, working together is very important. I'm conscious that Wales will soon be having electronic prescribing and med medicines uh, administration. And that's great, and it's going to be open architecture, I'm told, which I think is fantastic for the IT people. <coughs> but from a patient safety, I think Phil Routledge, if you look at his achievements, they're fantastic, but probably amongst the most important from a patient safety perspective was having a single prescribing uh, form for Wales. And I, I think Wales isn't big enough, really, to be thinking that we might have three different systems uh, so that would be my one plea on patient safety. So, moving on. Thank you all. Um, I hopefully covered everyone who's going to be talking today, but I'm delighted that uh, the Minister, Leonard Morgan, has taken time out to address today, uh, and I'd like to welcome her up, and thank you for attending.